Foster Care Nation, listen up. Hey, that's my line. What are you doing? I'm stealing it. Who said you could steal my line? Yeah, you know, you'll get over it. Besides that, we got news. I guess you're right. You do, we do have some news, don't we? We've talked about this for a little while, and we finally decided we're going to try and create this community. What we're really wanting to do is create a community made up of current and prospective foster and adoptive families. Yeah, so that we can have a place to share our stories and our struggles and seek support. Yeah, we want to do this on Sunday nights. We're going to do it the first and third Sunday night of every month. Our very first meeting will be the 18th of September, coming up about a week after you guys hear this. Our first meeting is going to be completely wide open. There's going to be a link in the show notes here to the Zoom meeting. And if you will just go down there and click on that and put it in your calendar, you'll be notified. Uh, Use Google calendars personally because I'm a Google guy, right? Well, yeah, if it doesn't go on Google, it doesn't get done. But if you're an Apple person, we'll let you put it in your Apple calendar too. We're not that picky. I just don't have an Apple calendar because those things don't work for my brain. And we're going to uh, have this set up to where anybody who has a link can join in. It'll be right down there in the show notes. And we'll discuss over the next week or two how you can join up. Because we're going to set this up to where people can join up and uh, create something of a membership where anybody in the family. So if it's a husband and a wife or if grandma's in the house helping out or whoever, we can all jump on and talk about some of the things that we're struggling through and some of the things where we might even be winning because, man, we all need some good stories. Oh, yeah. And, oh, we got some stories, and I'm certain you guys do, too. And we'd love to hear them. So we will see you guys on Sunday, September 18th at 8 p.m. Central Time. Uh, Like I said, the link is in the show notes, so put it in your calendar. You can forget a lot of things, Foster Care Nation, but never forget this. You're listening to Unparalleled Studios. Foster Care Nation, listen up. This is Foster Care and Unparalleled Terminator. Strength for the powerless. Courage for the fearful. Hope and healing for wounded hearts. Hello and welcome back to Foster Care and Unparalleled Journey with Jason and no Amanda. Amanda's not here today, guys. She's out doing that mom stuff. We just got done recording another interview before um, before our last meeting, and we got done with that. And it just turns out she's going to go be mom for a little while, and I'm going to sit here and push buttons and, and talk in a microphone because she's better at her job and I'm better at mine. So um, today I bring to you a guest, Stephanie Olson. Stephanie, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Jason. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm glad to have you here. Stephanie is also a podcaster. She has a podcast yep. called Resilience in Life and Leadership, correct? Yes, that's right. I love it when I get it right the first try. <laughs> it's always better that way. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody respond to me uh, on an email and reference the podcast. I think it was one I did recently with Mary. No, I just did it again with Marcy Pusey. And she referenced that episode and, and put Mary P- Pusey haha uh-huh, marcy and i'm like oh yeah i did leave that oh, in there didn't funny. I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm i'm awesome with screwing things up so um don't be too awful offended if i screw things up don't be afraid hey, to I'm correct good. me i'm good at making <laughs> mistakes um stephanie is also an author she has a book out there called jesus is passing by what are you waiting for and another book in the works that i don't know if we have a title for that one yet or we have not. no title no title <laughs> but you... it's about human trafficking and it's written for parents i have several books written in my head that have titles yeah. already already made for them i just yeah can't seem to get anybody to sell the book if i don't actually write it down i have the titles yeah though. it's harder that way title well maybe you have a title i can use i don't know <laughs> well i'll tell you right now the, the book i need to, to get around to writing is is going to be called nobody hears you when you yell oh and yeah, if you've been a parent a good for, book actually yeah if you've been a parent for about five minutes you know like at some yeah. point they just make you want to yell and scream and rip your hair out 
Yeah, I actually heard a woman on television. Um, everybody would know who she is if I said her name, which I won't, who said, I have never yelled at my children. And I thought, you are a liar. <laughs> <laughs> that one's right up yes. there with the old, uh, the old, the checks in the mail, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Honest, it is. I, I, I sent the check yesterday. It should be there any day now, man. <laughs> Yeah, if you never yelled at your kids, you probably don't know their name. That's correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's the book that's in my head somewhere that I need to get all put out on paper. I did actually write quite a bit for, towards it once and then did the smart thing and wrote it all with an ink pen and paper and then sent it off somewhere uh. and had it transcribed. And as it turns out, the people doing the transcription apparently were not English first speakers. And so they, oh. they did a lot of great work, but they're trying to yeah. read my handwriting and turn it into something. So there's a lot of work. Someday I'll have time to join you as an author, but until <laughs> then we're going to let you have that, that title. here. That sounds yeah. good. That sounds good. Okay. So um, you, you talk a lot about human trafficking. We talk a lot about foster and adoptive kids. Yeah. There seems it's a, to be it's a strong link there. Yeah. Yep. A real intersection between those two topics. You know, I, I hear stories. As a matter of fact, the interview we did earlier was uh, was with a therapist, Carlos Lack, who um, who talked about having dealt with kids who who made some reports of having been physically and sexually yeah. abused by a foster, a former foster family at that point in their life. Sure. But yeah, I mean, sexual abuse and trafficking, that all kind of runs together and we hate that it happens, but we don't want to hide from it either. We want to talk Correct. about it and give people Absolutely. the skills to be able to discuss this out loud and make some changes in this. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about human trafficking. What, what brought you into that world? Well, um, I actually came into this world kicking and screaming. I always say I had worked with women in the area of domestic and sexual violence. And, um, I had been speaking to women all over really wanting them to live a victorious life. Uh, that is hard to do when you're dealing with all those other things. And one of the women that I worked with said, Hey, let's help sex trafficked victims, having no idea what that meant. I mean, we were clueless and, um, you know, we kind of had the movie taken in our minds. So those of you who have seen the movie taken, it's about two girls who go off to Europe by themselves and they meet this good looking guy, they get kidnapped, they get sold into the sex trade. And fortunately for one of them, Liam Neeson is their dad and he can kick some serious badoosh. And so that is really what we think a lot about trafficking, that it is all about kidnapping, shipping overseas, and this forceful taking of someone. And the reality, well, and let me backtrack just a little bit. There were a lot of good things in our area happening in the counter trafficking arena, but there was nobody who was talking to the targets of trafficking, which is our youth. And um, that's really who is being targeted. No one was talking to their parents. Nobody was talking to, um, you know, foster parents, foster care staff workers, people who worked with youth. Nobody was doing that. And so that's really how we started and um, wrote a curriculum that was really guided um, to youth, but very interactive, engaging and no fear mongering, because this is a scary enough topic alone. Let's not throw, hey, be really afraid of this. So you don't do that and don't do this. And um, we really tried to make it a very empowering curriculum. Yeah, I, I have a friend of mine who um, who was talking one day about he lives in a different state. He's in the military and his wife mm -hmm. is having a military husband. She's very situationally aware. And she was at the gym. Yeah. Some guy came over and started talking to her and she she thought everything felt really odd. Mm -hmm. And when she went to leave, he tried to get her to get into his car with him. And she was like, um, this is not right. And she jumps in her car. First thing she did was hit the lock button. Second thing she did was mm -hmm. to call her husband. Or actually, she called 911 first and then the husband. And then um, they were following her for a bit. And what what these fools didn't know is the guy that 
that, that she happened to be married to was very tied in with some alphabet agencies. And I, I have a feeling they may have met some of those guys down the road. <laughs> there was, there was something about a shipping container and people, and he doesn't know the rest of the story or if he does, he's not telling it. And that's okay. Cause I'm just fine with them, with them not getting away with whatever they were trying to get away with. Yeah. And, and her having stepped out of that and be, been safe because that's, yeah. I mean, that's a real goal, but I mean, this was a grown woman. Think about these exactly. kids coming into foster care, kids who've lost their first family, kids who don't have a close support network around them, Correct. kids who maybe have a whole bunch of friends in this school, but they're in the school two counties over now mm -hmm. because they got pulled away from their home and they don't have that friend network around them. They don't necessarily have the same family network. Uh, they, they've lost a whole lot. And yeah. so now we have these kids who are very, very, very vulnerable mm -hmm. and how that's do right. we keep them safe? Yeah, well, um, that is a great question. Let me first define human trafficking. And then I want to talk about um, what that vulnerability can look like. So human trafficking is the buying and selling of a human being for the personal profit or gain of another through force, fraud or coercion. Now with a minor, uh, that any, if we're talking sex trafficking, for example, because there's different forms of human trafficking. But when we're talking about sex trafficking with a minor, any form of commercial sex is considered sex trafficking. So you don't have to prove that force, fraud, or coercion. Um, now, we often think of that force, but what typically happens is through fraud and coercion. So traffickers go after the vulnerable to lure the individuals they traffic, typically not to kidnap them. Most traffickers um, do not kidnap. What they do is build relationships. And so through fraud, it could be a fake relationship through coercion. Um, you know, it, it's manipulation, blackmail type of stuff. But when we're talking about kiddos in the foster care system, obviously being taken from your family of origin is, is a traumatic experience, a traumatic event. There's typically trauma that precipitated that or else they wouldn't be removed from their family of origin. And so they're dealing with a lot already. And what a trafficker is going to do is take a look at that individual and say, Hey, let me make you feel better. And that grooming process can begin. And sometimes a trafficker can groom an individual before they ever traffic them for a year or more. Um, so the majority of trafficked individuals don't even self-identify as being trafficked. They don't see themselves as victims. This is someone I love. This is someone I trust. Yeah. You know, there's the, the, TV show out there, um, Catfish. Yeah. It sounds like that's a great beginning to a lot of this. We to, to some extent, um, the biggest difference between catfish and what traffickers do is that catfishers are not ever themselves. They are, um, you know, they're not only developing a fraudulent relationship, but they're developing a fraudulent persona. And the majority of traffickers are actually themselves, whether they um, pursue somebody online, which is the number one way through social media, or they pursue them in person, they're, they're being who they are for the most part. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause you know, I'm gonna be honest, um, for anybody who can't see me, there is a little bit of gray popping into the hair here and all these newer terminologies. That does happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The newer <laughs> terminology, you know, it took me a while to know it cat. I actually had to watch the show catfishing to figure out what, because I, I knew what catfishing was as a kid. My grandpa had a catfish pond out back. Yep. <laughs> which, well, when we went out and got dinner, right? That, that was all catfishing was, and it's a whole different animal now. Yeah. Well, the show actually named it. So it was created by a movie that this guy did, and it was a, um, a riff basically on true catfish that these fishermen would use um, instead of selling, well, I don't know, whatever kind of fish, they would throw catfish in there to make it look like a better product. And so the catfish were the false fish. So it, 
that's what it, it, it st- comes from, but it really is about fraudulent, whatever fish or people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, this online world we have right now is a great place for fraudulent stuff to happen. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's easy. Um, you know what, what traffickers or anybody who wanted to do harm used to do, have take a lot of legwork, they can do it a pr- push of a button right now. And that is probably the number one way that I talk to parents. And I will tell you with foster parents, it's a little bit more challenging, but the number one way is to help our kiddos safely navigate social media, not remove it, no need to remove it. They're going to get access to it anyway, but help them safely navigate and learn what is appropriate, what's not, what's safe, what's not. Because if they're putting all their stuff out there and then allowing anybody to follow them, that is a, a definite risk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because um, what is it? The um, Snapchat is the newest. Well, I don't know if it's the newest, but it's not the newest. That's for sure. It's the newest in my it's world. It's a popular one. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm a ways behind. But, you know, as I understand, <laughs> I heard a podcast somewhere where they, they talked about where, where Snapchat originally came from. And it was originally an app, I believe, called Peekaboo. And it was a porn sharing app. Mm-hmm. I, I know it's going to shock a lot of people, but it was developed by college students and uh, <laughs> a, a porn sharing app. And yeah. now now your kid probably has an account there and you just don't know it yet because you know they have some strange name you know unicorn fart 1077 and they're not easy to find well and and snapchat has become very mainstream and um very kid friendly quote unquote with all of the filters and all the fun things you can do with snapchat and so uh you know they have put some safety things in Snapchat. But again, it goes back to knowing what your kiddos are doing online, monitoring that being a part of their social media life, and really walking them through that. And I say that's in part harder for foster parents, because a lot of times, you know, with with my kids, for example, I can say, hey, this is my phone. I'm going to look at it anytime I want. But with a foster family, sometimes that's not the case. The phone is the, you know, the parents of origin. And so the kid can say, hey, this is my phone. This isn't your phone. And so it does make it a whole lot more challenging to parent um, in in that social media world. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, getting getting trust and buy-in from a kid in the foster system. Oh, boy. Oh, man. They've already experienced enough distrust of yeah. humans in their life. And you're yeah. just the next human that, yeah. that they're not ready to trust yet. Correct. And one of the things we talk a lot about um, when we talk to parents or educators or adults, we talk about what that looks like to be a safe adult. And so we really walk through with foster parents what, what it means from a kid's perspective to be that safe adult in their life. Cause that's something they may never have experienced before. That's a great point. That's a great point. So many of these kids have been raised by people who, who maybe just aren't, aren't mature enough. I mean, let's be honest, yeah. kids are raising kids these days. And that's yes. a lot of these kids coming into care have got a yeah. very young parent who oftentimes in our experience, almost, almost every time has an addiction issue and they're struggling with that. They don't have the the time and the wherewithal and the knowledge to understand how much other bad stuff is out there in the world and, and be spending their life's energy and protecting their kid. You know, if, especially if they have an addiction issue that they're working through at the moment. Right. Well, and we kind of set, um, foster kiddos up a little bit because, you know, we, tell them, oh, I tell stranger danger used to be a big thing and it's not anymore. And that's probably a good thing, but there are other things that we need to talk about. And one of the things we talk about with our kiddos is what is the trustworthy person? What are the characteristics of a trustworthy person? Foster kids are set up to, okay, now you're going to meet this stranger. You got to trust them. Now you're going to meet this stranger. You got to trust them. And so really giving them that foundation of what does a trustworthy person actually look like? What does a safe adult 
look like and and what does that mean? And that's really hard to do with someone who has been in a series of of non-trustworthy people in their lives. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because we've interviewed a lot of people who did come up through the foster system and sure. a frightening majority of them talk about abuse in one home or another. Absolutely. Physical, verbal, sexual, some sort of abuse. And so, yeah, they, they're they not going to necessarily be right off the bat ready to trust me because, mm-hmm. you know, well, well, for one, look at me, you know. <laughs> 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 it's funny. I, I can go into the grocery store and and it, it might be a little girl, a three year old girl sitting in the front of a cart somewhere, and they look at me and see right through all this stuff, the, all this this leave me alone face that I might have on, so that I can get to the grocery <laughs> store quickly because it's it's a sport to me to see how fast I can get through the grocery store yeah. and get out. Ask my wife; she does not like to go to the grocery store with me, but but that three year old little girl will see me and smile and wave at me, yeah. and then. Then her mom sees her smiling and waving at me and suddenly they're in the next aisle trying to get away. <laughs> That's hilarious. But yeah, That's young, funny. Yeah. Young kids, you know, little kids oftentimes who don't have a big trauma, they might see through that. But most kids who've had some sort of trauma in their life, they see every human as the next potential abuser. Right. Right. But, Which is uh, horrifying. Yeah. I'm not mad at them at all for it because it, it makes sense. So, so, and so I, if you've got somebody who's coming in who knows that and who is good at pretending to be an honest and trustworthy person, then that is just right there, easy to take advantage of. And so I think that's, that's where, you know, traffickers or anybody who wants to do harm could really gain access in a, in a foster care youth. Yeah, I remember being a teenager and having a friend of mine who told me this guy she was dating was just such a really nice guy. And and um, I'm like, well, how do you know he's a nice guy? She says, well, he told me so. Oh, well, there you go. Yes. I kind of looked at her and said, wait, 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 he had to tell you that he was a nice guy in order for you to know it? <laughs> you know, she's in a good relationship and has kids of her own. We're all grown now and everything worked out. But in that yeah. moment in time, I was like, yeah, you might want to rethink the way that you're yeah. making judgments on people. If somebody has yeah. to tell you they're a good guy, there's a reason he has to tell you. Yeah, there's a problem with that. Yeah, it's hard because we are all looking for connection. We're all looking for relationship. And um, that's not a bad thing in and of itself. But if we don't know what a healthy relationship looks like, and we're not necessarily healthy, we're going to attract, you know, unhealthy, healthy attracts healthy. And so it's, it's one of the things we also teach in is not just trafficking, um, sex and labor, but we teach social media safety. And we also teach healthy versus unhealthy relationships because, when you know what a healthy or unhealthy relationship looks like that can help prevent, um, trafficking because that's how they start. They look like relationships and then they turn unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not nearly as common these days to see a, a 30 or 40 year marriage. It's a healthy relationship. Um, the, we just don't see that modeled for us a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. Not as much. Unfortunately, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you mentioned earlier that you have a curriculum that you're, uh, you're mm-hmm. getting ready to launch nationwide. What's the name of yes. that? And what does that look like? So the set me free project is the organization. The curriculum is called ready to stand curriculum. And, um, we love it. We've been, we've been, using this curriculum for the last seven years, but for the last seven years, we've been using it going into schools ourselves and um, educating the youth and and training people. Now, for the first time ever, um, it is available for purchase for schools and um, communities and agencies to actually have this curriculum. We train counselors, social workers, teachers, whomever, how to give this curriculum. And then we support them for an entire year. There's opportunity for online training. And um, we really make it so that, that you have the ability to do what we do 
in your community because it's so important that it's that this prevention nobody talks about prevention but if we could actually stop human trafficking before it starts only one to two percent of trafficked individuals are recovered which is a staggering number so if we can stop it before we it starts that's huge and education is is key yeah that's a terrifying number especially as a parent of, of yeah. children across, because let's just be honest um trafficking is not gender specific correct oh my goodness no it is absolutely not there is this mindset and myth that it is that traffic traffic individuals are always girls and traffickers are always big bad men the reality is that not only are boys trafficked almost equally but the lgbtq plus community is a huge um uh vulnerability for that as well and not because they're lgbt but because they may have been um, displaced they're not feeling accepted whatever it may be and all of those vulnerabilities are um, gone after, but any, I, I would say traffickers don't care. They don't care your race, your age, your, um, it's just your ability to make money. And that is that you're breathing actually. That's, that's terrifying. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's very true. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that anybody is a, is a victim, a potential victim here. And so yes. it's, so how do people reach out to you if they're interested in presenting this to their school or their group or, yeah. you know, in our world, caseworkers who, who see kids on a regular basis? For sure. We, yes, there, we, we also do agency trainings and, and actually, um, yeah, people who are working with the youth, juvenile justice, all that. So they can um, reach out to us at setmefreeproject.net. And um, you can absolutely contact me directly at Stephanie, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E, at setmefreeproject.net. So, yeah, we we love to partner with people and really get those resources in people's hands. Yeah, because that that high school age, I would imagine, is probably a pretty, pretty common target area because, well... I like. I was gonna say because you know younger kids don't have as much social media and aren't as easy to reach, but nowadays they are. They really are. So yeah, middle school is a really big risk factor. High school too, but middle school, um, and we start our curriculum in kindergarten. So we have a curriculum from kindergarten through college age for youth and then for adults of every facet of the community, because unfortunately. Um, yeah, kids are, have access to social media at a very, very young age. And, and although in kindergarten through sixth grade, we're not talking about social media or I'm sorry, we're not talking about sex trafficking, but we're talking about social media safety. We're talking about consent. We're talking about a trustworthy person and what that looks like in safe adults. And, um, yeah, I did a, I did a social media presentation at a boy scout group of preschoolers and they knew i swear more than half the high school students so it is really important that it starts at a very young age yeah because i'm one of those abusive parents who has uh, kids in the let's see one boy going into first grade and one going into third grade and can you believe it or not i, I don't have a phone for either one of them yet what I may yeah. just have to report that. And they wow. don't have social media or anything. Yeah. It's terrible. They don't even have a tablet. Unbelievable. Well, and you know what? That's that's the thing that schools are giving our kiddos tablets. And at in fourth grade is where it typically happens, um, what I've seen around it. We actually have a school that requires all of their kiddos and the parents to go through our training before they get their Chromebooks. That's great because, you know, our schools require the kids to use the, the Chromebooks yeah. and or tablets. Um, they were giving out tablets to the kindergartners and everybody over kindergarten was getting a Chromebook to use. Mm. Now in, in my house, if that's at the house, I'm, I'm very closely guarded as to what you're using yeah. at the age, especially you're only using it in front of me. I get to see what's on the screen at all times. Yeah. Um, 
but you know we also had we had some issues with one of the kids we had in high school who was who was not using technology appropriately and i at one point did go in take the chromebook back to the school and revoked the uh, technology permission that we gave them and said hey this kid needs needs paper copies of the work because right right we can't do this and it was it was specific struggle with that kid and i'd love to say he worked through it all but you know high school boys are not always that easy to work with um <laughs> i look back and, and all i can say is i'm sorry mom i know i was a jack wagon <laughs> <laughs> but think of how much you didn't have to deal with mom because i did not have that kind of technology oh no, true yes yeah, I, so my generation was the first generation of parents who had to parent social media kids. And now we've got parents who have lived life with only social media. And it's just, it, it changes not only the mindset of how we connect with people, how we build relationships with people, but it literally changes our brain chemistry. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, the folks of the good people over at Facebook spent millions of dollars learning how to get dopamine hits into the brain to get right. addicted to it. And, and it's traveled through every social media app after that, because I know Facebook yeah. is not the typical culprit of the problems for kids today, because apparently only old folks are on, on, on Facebook and, uh, you can find us there. Yes. <laughs> I'm a proud old folk. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things these kids don't understand the way that the brain is yeah. controlled and manipulated through the Correct. things like dopamine hits. Well, let me tell you, um, on Facebook alone, trafficking luring increased 142% just last year. That's wow. Facebook alone. And Instagram was around that, I think a little bit lower. So, these are, you know, when, um, when social media companies say, you know, this is our mission, we're trying to make it safe. There are legitimate things that are not happening for safety purposes. And they're allowing these things to get, um, allowing people to take advantage of other people. So kids are still on Facebook or young adults and whatever it may be, but yeah, it's, it's everywhere and it's increasing tremendously. Yeah. And I'm so glad that we have somebody like you out there who's helping train the adults around these kids and in, in their, uh, in their support groups to, to mm -hmm. realize how we can do this safely because I mean, none of us want to sit down with our seven year old and have that conversation about what the real yeah. dangers are. No, no. And, and the, the beauty of what we do is that we do it in an age appropriate way. We've got amazing educators on our staff that um, have studied developmental, um, you know, appropriateness. We've, we work with trauma therapists and there's, there's appropriate and, and not appropriate ways to talk to your kiddos about this. And so that's what we really do love to help parents, um, through and educators and who we'll talk to anyone who listens to us really <laughs> good because these kids are everywhere yeah um, you know people don't really think about it too much but half a million kids in foster care in the nation right now yeah, that's, and that's the most vulnerable part of the population i have right. no idea how many kids are actually you know out there on social media right now and yeah. vulnerable in their own rights as well at the same moment but it, the yeah. number's got to be staggering well, and then you think about the kiddos who are coming out of foster care with such a lack of support and looking for help. And it's, it's just, they really need to know um, where to find that support, where to go. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a tough, tough road. So if you're talking to people who, um, who a large part of our audience is people who are interested in becoming foster parents themselves. So if you're awesome. talking to them, what would you tell them to look out for on, on, to be able to be prepared to handle kids who are, who are at risk for this? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, I would say kudos to you. It is a very, um, 
wonderful thing that you're doing, but knowing what it is that you're, you're getting into is so important because I would say the number one thing to remember is that the kiddos are, um, coming from trauma situations. Now we all have trauma, trauma is trauma is trauma, right? But, um, when you're dealing with kiddos who have experienced severe trauma, you really need to look at that and, and work with them through a trauma informed lens. So that is part of what our, um, what our, our curriculum teaches. And we love to do webinars by the way, with, with parents. So if anybody's interested in doing a webinar or something, we absolutely can do that. But looking at these kiddos through a trauma-informed lens. So if you've got a kiddo who has been sexually abused, has been through sexual violence, um, you know, touch is maybe not going to be the one thing that um, they find that might make them just go ballistic. And so knowing that if you know, asking for consent for everything. Is it okay if I put my hand on your shoulder? Is it okay? You know, do you, are you a hugger asking things like that? Because I think those are so important, but what do you look for? If you've got a kiddo in your home and you think, gosh, I'm, I'm nervous that there might be a trafficking situation going on. Um, the, the number one thing I think to look for is look for any sort of change in what is typical for them. So whatever their typical is, all of a sudden it's no longer their typical. There is some sort of change, whether it be in clothing, the way they look, the way they talk, that's a red flag. They start to, um, maybe they have a partner who is older or somebody that just doesn't seem like this is a good fit, um, or they're hanging out with people that are, um, potentially, um, you know, again, older and into some things that might be concerning. Those are red flags. And now again, these can be red flags for any teenager, but specific to trafficking, that's what might, it might look like look for conversations on social media that, you know, who is this person? How do you know them? Asking those questions. Tell me about your followers. Where did you meet them? Um, but looking for pictures on social media that may not be appropriate, looking for um, seeking out attention in a, a way that might be inappropriate. But the other thing to look for is with trauma, maybe there's some dissociation going on. So all of a sudden you're talking to them and it's like, they're not even present. That could be an indicator that there's serious trauma um, happening in their life. And so those are some of the things you look for. All of a sudden they've got a bunch of money that they didn't have. Now this would be during the grooming process. When someone's being trafficked, they don't get a dime, but all of a sudden they have money or they have hotel key cards that you see laying around, or there's, um, gifts that they have that you think where in the world could you have purchased that? Those are indicators of a grooming process. You know, Hey, this is what you're going to get. Let me get you these gifts. I love you. You know, all of this stuff. So those are just some of the indicators that you might look for. That might be an indicator that mm, maybe something's off here. Yeah. Okay. That, that's great information because we need to, to do whatever we can do to keep kids as safe as possible. Yeah. And Absolutely. Stephanie, I just, I just want to say again, that I really do appreciate what you guys are doing over there at the set me free project and, and really just working to protect kids because yeah. this is something that's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately it is. Yeah. Yeah. I remember people back when, when I was a young kid, um, one of the particular, people who went to our, our church I grew up in. Um, she was, I found out later, I always thought, you know, she, she always spoke kind of different and asked weird questions and stuff. I found out later she worked for a, one of the law enforcement alphabet agency type people. And that's what she dealt mm -hmm. with. She dealt with crimes against kids. And yeah. a lot of it had to do with, with trafficking back in the eighties and nineties. And yeah. we have not made it more difficult for them with today's no. online experience. No, nope, we've definitely made it easier. And I will also add the bottom line of our, 
the foundation of all of our curriculum is you have an intrinsic value that no one can change. And some of these kids have never heard that they have value, they have worth, they have human dignity. And that's the, the bottom line. And if we can start that relationship, I would say traffickers build really good relationships. We all as a community need to build better ones. Yes. Yeah. I think in so many ways we, we could make a lot of bad things go away if we just spent more time and more energy being good humans. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Stephanie. I appreciate you coming in and talking about this. And again, if anybody wants to reach out to you and look and look at your training or curriculum or have you on a webinar, cause it sounds like that's the sort of thing that, that, that really gets you going. Um, yeah. where, how would they do that? You can reach us at setmefreeproject.net or contact me directly at stephanie at setmefreeproject.net and we will set you up. We love to be a resource. I'm, I'm here to answer questions or, um, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. We are available for you. Great. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Okay, Foster Care Nation. Thank you for listening to Stephanie's story. Now take her knowledge and wisdom to heart so you can create love and healing in your family and community. Be sure to come back next week. We have new episodes every Tuesday. If you would like to share your story as a guest, you can reach us at jason at fostercarenation.com. You can connect with other like-minded people on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash fostercareuj. And don't forget, we have a Patreon account where you can support our mission for as little as $5 a month. It's at patreon.com slash fostercarenation. The links to everything are in the show notes or in your podcast player, or at fostercarenation.com. And, as always, You are so super awesome! I thank you guys so cool, cool, cool! Yeah, yeah! Thank you for listening! Thanks, thanks, thanks! Unparalleled Studios. Studios.